brothers in Christ, our sermon text from Matthew chapter 21. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all those who were selling and buying in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. He said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the experts of the law saw the wonders he performed and heard the children calling out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They said to him, do you hear what they are saying? Yes, Jesus told them, have you never read? From the lips of little children and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. He left them, went out to the city to Bethany, and spent the night there. This is the word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, his final steps led to his father's house. I'm sure you've been there before where you were dealing with a situation where someone had a corner on the market. Probably when you were at an airport or or maybe at a concert and there's no competition and if you want to buy any, any, any refreshments, any bottled water, you have to pay these remarkably high prices for these items because there's no one else selling them. They have a captive audience so they can charge what they want. See, they know that you can't go anywhere else. You're stuck there. And so your choices are to either pay their high prices or to go without. In our lesson from God's word, we have Jesus heading to the temple. And you had this situation where people had turned the courtyard of the temple into a a marketplace, into this, this bustle of commercial activity. But it wasn't exactly upright. It wasn't exactly honest and fair because what had happened is that that the, the leaders of the temple had allowed certain people to set up shop to, to sell these animals for the sacrifice. And so if you were a Gentile who, who wanted to worship God, you were you were in a lot of trouble because this was really the only place that you could go to worship. If you were a Gentile convert, you're supposed to, to worship in the courtyard, but it's filled with all of these animals, with this whole marketplace. Not really a very worshipful setting. All of the crowds, all of the, the noise and confusion and animals. So you really didn't have a, a very good option for worshiping the one true God. It's not really a very good look for the temple to, to have the, the Gentile followers to, to be forced to, to try to, to do their worship in this space where there's all of this marketplace going on. And they weren't just charging a whole lot. They had this whole scheme figured out with the temple leaders where people would come to to give their offerings and you would have to pay their prices for the animals because the 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 temple leaders they got their cut if you tried to bring an animal from outside if you tried to 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 circumvent that that price gouging well then you would find that that the temple leaders didn't qualify that animal as being an acceptable one for the sacrifice and they would point you to one of their temple vendors one of their temple merchants so they really kind of had this corner on the market where they were charging people and getting their cut but it wasn't just that they also 
had these money changers in there. And so what these money changers were doing is they would take people's money and they would exchange it for the only coin that was acceptable for paying the temple sacrifice. And they were gouging people because they were charging this very unreasonable exchange rate and profiting from that. They were only accepting this one kind of coin. And it seems pretty likely from historical sources that not only were they charging people this obscene interest rate in order to get even more money from them so that they could pay this temple tax with the only coin that they would accept for the temple tax. But it seems from historical sources that they were actually counterfeiting that coin. It wasn't even a legitimate coin. It wasn't from the source that it was supposed to be from. They made the coin and then passed it off as something else and then charged a phenomenal unfair exchange rate when you tried to get this coin to pay your temple tax. So it kind of makes sense when Jesus would say something like, you have turned my father's house into a den of thieves. You can see where he's getting at. It really was a pretty dishonest operation, and the leaders of the temple, the religious leaders of the people, were in on it, and they were profiting from this situation. So Jesus comes in and he flips over tables and he drives every one of the, the, the merchant type situations out of the courtyard. The interesting thing about this situation is that Jesus did it single handedly. So for all those people, all of that commotion, all of the merchants, all of the, the animals, the money vendors, all of them, and Jesus clears them out single-handedly. Now that should intrigue us because Jesus didn't exactly go in and take care of it with an army. Right? This wasn't a you and what army situation. Jesus did it by himself. And how could he pull that off? See, the temple had temple guards. They had people that would kind of keep things under control. But none of them intervened. No one tried to stop Jesus. I think it's just fascinating because there are people that were probably there that day when Jesus cleared the temple that were there just a few days later when he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. I wonder how many of those temple guards were there that crossed over because they saw him do that and no one lifted a finger to try to stop him. That is just how much influence, just how much power Jesus had from a cultural perspective. I don't think anyone else would have gotten away with that. They would have gotten, they would have flipped one table and the temple guard would have intervened and would have dragged him off. But they didn't do that. They were so afraid, so considerate of how much popularity, how much power, how much influence Jesus had, that they didn't do anything to him. He cleared that temple out single-handedly. Now, before we get too deeply convicting of the people of Jesus' day, and all of this, this marketplace and all of this, this economic activity and the greed that we see in the temple courtyards before we start getting puffed up and thinking that we're pretty great. Yeah, those, those, those people back then, they were such foolish sinners, but we're just a little bit better. We would never do something like that. We struggle with how to properly view 
wealth as well. We struggle with earthly treasures. We struggle with chasing after the things of this world. We suffer from greed. We live in a country that's one of the most affluent in the world. We have so much, and it's so easy to make that important. It's so easy to to make our money the priority. To put you with this example, imagine that you're in a situation where you you have this, this unexpected expense. Maybe it's a car breaking down. Maybe it's a medical procedure that that came out of nowhere. And all of a sudden you're looking at this this big bill. You're looking at this big expense that that you're not really sure where all the money's going to come from. And all of a sudden things get tight. And instead of feeling like things are good, you're wondering how you're going to make ends meet. And in that situation, isn't it so easy to, 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 to be focusing so much on how we're going to solve the problem, on how we're going to find the money? And we're filled with all of these, these negative emotions, these negative thoughts, maybe even negative thoughts towards our Creator for allowing us to be in this bad situation. And if He was really a good God, maybe He would protect us and maybe make sure that we had what we needed, but He allowed this to come into our life. Brothers and sisters, we can fall victim of placing the wrong priority and value on wealth just the same as those people back in Jesus' day. Because the issue is, when we face that situation, when we have that that situation which we don't know where we're going to make ends meet, we have this big bill coming up, we don't know how we're going to pay it, we find ourselves in that situation isn't really the issue that we're looking at the wrong person. We're trusting in the wrong person. We're focusing way too much on me and how I'm going to solve it and what I'm going to do and how I'm going to use my resources and my strength to get me out of this jam. In that situation, we need to recognize who's really in control, that it's God. He's the one that's in control of our lives. He's the one that allows these things to happen in our lives, and he's going to work everything out according to our eternal good. Now, that doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy. That doesn't mean that, that, that it's just everything's going to magically solve itself. But God has a reason for placing this into our lives, and it might be because he's trying to shape us to be the sort of disciples that he wants us to be. He is in control. And throughout that whole experience, maybe we're doing too much focusing on me and what I'm going to do and how I'm going to solve it instead of trusting in our God. The first thing you should do in that situation is give it to the Lord in prayer. To ask him to to be there and to guide you and to give you wisdom and to give you guidance in how you handle this situation. And God, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I know that I still trust in you. Because if we allow some simple little situation like thinking we don't have enough money to get us to doubt God's goodness, doubt his providence, doubt his strength, doubt his leadership in our lives and we're really doing the same thing putting this this inappropriate importance upon wealth and money and riches instead of trusting in the god who promises to be with us brothers and sisters there are plenty of situations in which it's easy to fall into this sin But the amazing thing about what happened in the temple after Jesus cleared out all of the money changers and all the marketplaces, all of these people came and and Jesus healed people that were blind, people that were lame. There was this miraculous gathering that happened once Jesus cleared out the temple and sort of put it into a more holy 
God-pleasing situation. There was this, this, this confluence of people coming to Jesus and he healed them right then and there in the temple. What, what a glorious situation. Instead of having people that were trying to swindle the, their, fellow, their fellow countrymen out of a quick buck, all of a sudden you have all these people coming to Jesus in faith, in trust that he would heal them. And he did. Jesus opened the eyes of the blind. Jesus healed feet that that, that couldn't walk. And now they can. And that's just such a a better use of of the temple. But it's so much more than just an opportunity for Jesus to be a nice guy. You see, when Jesus healed all of these people in the temple, it's so much more than than a kind act. Jesus, when he healed all of those people in the temple, was providing this this testimony sealed and, and, and proven by miracles that he was who he was claiming to be. This is significant. Jesus was claiming to be the, 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 the Christ, the Son of God the Messiah, the one who was to come. And here he is healing the blind, healing the lame, healing the sick, performing all of these miracles that at this point we're sort of used to. But it wasn't lost on these temple leaders, on these religious leaders. They realized what was at stake with Jesus healing people uh, of their blindness, uh, of, of being lame, right there in the temple courts. Jesus is, is, is showing that he really is the Messiah, and that means that they're wrong. That means that they're in trouble. That means that, that their religious power is being threatened right before their eyes in the seat of their power. And they couldn't have that. And they tried even harder to, to find some excuse to capture him, to arrest him, to condemn him, to get him out of the picture. They were really upset that, that the, the children were praising him. These, these cries of Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. People saying something like that is people proclaiming that they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the anointed one, the Savior who was to restore the kingdom of Israel. The temple leaders knew that. And so they wanted Jesus to to stop it. They wanted Jesus to, to, to silence the, the, the little children from saying things like that. And what did he say? He said, have you not read from the lips of little children and nursing babies you have prepared praise? Well, obviously they had read. In fact, they were experts in the Old Testament. They probably knew the section of scripture that Jesus was quoting by heart. And they knew that Isaiah and some of the other prophets had said things like, the blind will be healed and the lame will walk at the coming of this Messiah. So they wanted to get rid of him. When Jesus had this group had this healing, had this opportunity to have a much more sanctified activity going on in the temple courts. It was fitting that people should praise, that from the lips of the children that they should cry Hosanna. And it's fitting for us too as brothers and sisters in Christ. When we gather around God's word, it is good for us to be able to have the chance to confess our sins to receive absolution, to praise our God, to join with all the saints that have gone before and say, Hosanna to the Son of David. It is good for us to gather together as brothers and sisters and to worship our God, to be reminded of our sin, to have that that law gospel ministry take place 
each and every time we gather together to be reminded of our sin, reminded of our Savior. During his final steps, he was led to his father's house. He he drove out that corrupt money-making scheme, and instead he healed people and caused praise to go to his father in heaven. He opened the eyes of the blind and the feet of the lame so that they could walk. Little children praising him. His final steps led him to his father's house where he gave praise to his father in heaven. Amen. And may the peace which transcends all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time we join in our next hymn, hymn 398.